have greater peace and we can have greater joy in our lives. And uh, so, again, we're here for you. So if you are in need of fellowship, uh, person-to-person fellowship, online is awesome, and we are so blessed, and we are continuing. Thank God for our IT guys. Uh, they just continue to push the envelope and help us uh, to learn new skills. And so we're, we're purchasing new equipment all the time and taking it to the next uh, level, so to speak. And so we're blessed to be able to provide that. So for families that can't be with us, and especially those with uh, children, um, we're doing uh, more and more to be able to serve you online. So just keep praying for us. We're praying for you. And we're, I think I, I read today that September 21st, if I'm not mistaken, is uh, Back to Church Sunday. Is what the, It's National Back to Church Sunday. And so we're, we're praying that uh, this COVID virus will be under control and maybe uh, everybody can be back uh, in fellowship without any hesitation or reservation come September. So, uh, but all through the rest of the summer, we're here and uh, we're blessed to be able to minister to you. I'm excited uh, as John Jones is teaching tonight in the book of Psalms. Uh, you have your Bible handy. If, and again, if you don't own a Bible and you need one, all you have to do is contact the church and we will get you a Bible. We are still giving away Bibles. So uh, as people have need, so we always want to remind you of that. We'd love to serve you in that capacity. So uh, just a couple things to tell you about. You know, with the, we have... Uh, our children's camp coming up. So if you uh, have your children signed up for that or um, you have a desire, you need to contact Vanessa at ccbakersfield.com very quickly. And we've also got our kids uh, vacation Bible camp coming up in August. And uh, you can go online and check that out or you can contact us at the church office at 397-6000, ask for Vanessa. And uh, she can get you more information with regard to that as well. Most of the Bible studies are all online at this point, and so just want to encourage you to take part, except for our men's Bible study is meeting on Monday nights right here on campus and online as well at 6.30 p.m., and then on Wednesday mornings at 6 a.m., and it's a hybrid study there as well, so you can catch it online if you'd like, or uh, you can join us over in the cafe. And so again, ministry just continues as needs continue. I just want to say thank you for your faithfulness in giving to the Lord uh, during this time. You know, again, it's everything has become a new normal, so is our giving. You can do that online. You can also do it if you show up in person and, and drop it off in the Agape box or mail that to us uh, at the church address there. And uh, again, just thank you for your faithfulness in giving to the Lord. Thank you for your faithfulness in serving. I uh, just want one great big praise report you know, on our new ministry, Together We Can, uh, where we provide food for families. We do that on the third Sunday of the month and so we're collecting food throughout the month, and then especially on that Sunday, and then distributing it. We started the first week, and this was just all just by word of mouth. We had like 25 vehicles the very first uh, weekend that we did it. And I think uh, this last weekend we had 50-some-odd, uh, but we actually fed over 70, about 75, 78 families. So uh, we were really blessed to be able to do that. So thank you guys for supporting that. Um, you can go online, and again, you really do need an electronic device so that you can stay up with us and on your electronic device go to uh, the app store there and on the app store uh, just type in Calvary Chapel Bakersfield and then it'll pull up our church app and you can download that onto your uh, smart device electronic device and uh, you can stay up uh, with us so you can follow along in the teachings uh, you know what's going on through the week you can stay connected to us you can email us uh, send in prayer requests uh, communicate with us ask questions uh, and we'd love to stay connected to you, but uh, we're blessed that uh, not only can we open up the church for you to be here, um, but we're glad that we have air conditioners that are still working. Amen. <laughs> Feels good in here. They did good tonight. So uh, again, thank you for that. Well, I'll invite you to stand to your feet. We're going to open up with a word of prayer, and then we're going to get into worship tonight. And uh, again, thank you guys for coming, and uh, thank you guys for joining us online. Be blessed tonight as we worship and serve the Lord. Father God, thank you for tonight. Thank you for the privilege again uh, to be able to come before you and, to, Lord, to, to worship you and to set our minds and our hearts to love you uh, with everything that we have. And so uh, we're just excited about tonight. We pray that you would anoint uh, our worship time, that you'd receive it from our hearts, that you'd sanctify us. Lord, we know that as we go through a week, uh, Lord, there's sin all around this world, and it seeks to do everything it can as to... to entangle us and your word says to lay aside the weight and the sin that so easily entangles us and to 
to run with endurance the race that's set before us, looking to Jesus. And so that's what we do tonight, Lord Jesus. We look to you. Uh, we we want to behold your face in this place. And we want to learn from you as we study your word together. We want to worship you together. We want to be one voice. And so we ask you to do what we really can't do in and of ourselves, but uh, we can desire it, but it's your spirit that does it, is that you would knit us together and make us one tonight. As your word says, how good and how pleasant it is when the brethren dwell together in unity. And so, Lord, have your way with us tonight. We love you, and Lord, we, we bless you as we pray in the wonderful name of Jesus. And we all agreed saying amen. Amen. Love that. Hopefully that stays. <laughs> Sorry if it doesn't. All right. Regardless... It's wonderful to be here. What a privilege it is to be able to gather together before the Lord. So, yeah, let's tell him that.
I love this next song because um, I'm a Christian, but sometimes I forget that uh, I need to worship Jesus and not those other things, not self-sufficiency, a, a job, a ministry, a person, like all of those things will eventually let me down, but Jesus never will. And so it's so nice to know also that, you know, he is our God. This is our God. Our God is not distant. He's not cold. He's not uncaring, but he's the God that desires to be intimate up close, decided that he would give his life to save ours, and so uh, I love to celebrate that, so let's do it. Your grace is enough, more than I need. At your word I will believe. I wait for you, draw near again. Let your spirit make me
Thank you, Lord. So we give you tonight as an offering of ourselves, and we open our minds and our hearts to you and your word and what you have to say. And Lord, I pray that no matter how hard the word is, no matter how far we feel from it, Lord, that we would still reckon it to ourselves, to our lives as truth, because it is. And because you're worth it, and uh, because you're awesome and you've been so gracious to us, you know, how could we not give ourselves back to you? And so we glorify you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Don't you love just praising the Lord? In, in fact, that's what we're going to be learning about tonight. If you turn with me to Psalms uh, 84, uh, as we read the whole chapter, this is one of my... Uh, favorite psalms, and I mean that truly. Uh, this one and the next one. To the chief musician on an instrument of Gath, a psalm of the sons of Korah. How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, even faints for the cor courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you, Salah. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage as they pass through the valley of Baca. They make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Salah. O God, behold our shield and look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in you. And so, Father, tonight I ask that you would just speak to us, uh, not through um, a man, but through your word. Let your Holy Spirit move mightily tonight. Let every single word be anointed by you. Now help us to understand each and every single word phrase, institution that we read in this section, Lord. Help us to apply it to our lives today. Thank you so much for the privilege that we have truly, just as the sons of Korah did when they wrote this uh, psalm, to say, I would rather be one day in the house of my God. And Lord, we are truly privileged tonight as we gather here, to be able to come and say, thank you, Lord, for allowing us to meet together in fellowship. Not just to worship you, but to praise you for who you are. To fall at your feet and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you accept us. That we have the privilege to become, become before your throne room and know that you hear each and every single one of the requests of our hearts, Lord. And we glorify you tonight. We glorify you with all of our hearts. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. It was 2011. We had been going through the, the Psalms uh, Wednesday morning, 6 a.m. to 7 a.m., and uh, we came to this psalm here, and, and I had read it before, uh, but I never actually studied it. And, and so as you go through this psalm, and it may hit you now, 
I mean, you may, may feel something, but if you understand the writer of the Psalms, if you understand the author of these two Psalms, Psalm 84 and 85, it takes on a whole different meaning, a, a much deeper meaning to the text itself. You see, in Psalms 84, we read the author of this psalm as to the chief musician on an instrument of gaff, a psalm of the sons of Korah. And the first question we should ask are, who are the sons of Korah, right? We know David, the author of many of the psalms, right? And we, we learned about the second most prolific author of the Psalms, Asaph. We just finished a section on him, uh, Psalm 73 to Psalms 83. But in these two next Psalms, we learn about the third most prolific writers in the Psalms. Uh, they wrote most of the 40s, by the way, and they wrote three of the 80s, uh, Psalm 84, Psalm 85, and Psalm 87. A and we see here an introduction to the reason why the sons of Korah actually wrote. You see, the sons of Korah came from a division within the Levitical tribe, the Levites. Not all the Levites were priests, by the way. In fact, only those that descended from the line of Aaron could be priests. The rest of the tribe, the Levitical tribe, was divided into three groups. You have the Gershonites, the Merarites, and the Kohathites. And Korah and his descendants, Korah and his sons, came from the line of Kohath. And they were the ones that had the most menial labor of all the Levitical tribes. In fact, in Numbers chapter 4, verse 17, we read how dangerous their job was. Numbers 4, 17. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Do not cut off the tribe of the families of the Kohathites from among the Levites, but do this in regard to them, that they may live and not die when they approach the most holy things. Aaron and his sons shall go in and appoint each of them to his service and his task. But they shall not go in to watch while the holy things are being covered, lest they die. You talk about a job where one mistake strikes you down. You see, the Kohathites not only had the privilege, but the responsibility to carry all the sacred things from within the innermost part of the tabernacle itself. Uh, they had the privilege of being able to bear on their shoulders the most sacred items from the tabernacle. Whenever, whenever that cloud would rise or, or that uh, fire would rise, the presence of God would move. The tabernacle had to be taken down and packed up. And who was it that carried the most holy of those items. It was the Kohathites through Korah. In fact, in Numbers chapter 7, we read also their responsibilities. Now it came to pass when Moses had finished setting up the tabernacle that he anointed it and consecrated it and all its furnishings and the altar and all its utensils. So he anointed them and consecrated them. Numbers chapter 7, verse 2. Then the leaders of Israel, the heads of their fathers' houses, who were the leaders of the tribes, and over those who were numbered, made an offering. And they brought their offering before the Lord, six covered carts, twelve oxen, a cart for every two of the leaders, for each one an ox. And they presented them uh, before the tabernacle. These oxen, these carts, were to be used in the transportation of the tabernacle as it was took, taken throughout the wilderness during the 40 years of wandering. 
And so this big, huge tent that was the central theme, the central area where the people of Israel would gather and worship God, this big, massive tent had to be taken down every single time they would move to a new location. And it was the Levitical tribe divided into these three different groups, these three different families that would take down the tabernacle itself. Verse 4, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Accept these from them, that they may be used in doing the work of the tabernacle of meeting. And you shall give them to the Levites, to every man according to his service. So Moses took the carts and the oxen and gave them to the Levites, two carts and four oxen he gave to the sons of Gershon according to their service, and four carts and eight oxen he gave to the sons of Merari according to their service under the authority of Ithamar, the son of Aaron, the priest. Verse 9. How many carts, how many oxen do the sons of Korah through the line of Kohath get? But to the sons of Kohath he gave none. Why? Because theirs was the service of the holy things which they carried on their shoulders. Do you understand how sacred their duty was? To carry the very holy things of God on their shoulders. This is why the Ark of the Covenant had poles. Uh, this is why uh, the incense uh, within the holy temple itself, the Holy of Holies, had, uh, had rings through which poles would go through. Why? Because they had to be carried between poles so they couldn't be touched because of the holiness of the sacred items that Korah and his sons carried. In Numbers chapter 16, we read of a revolt. In, in fact, if you were to read Numbers chapter 16, we, we find one of the most tragic events that's to happen within the Israelite nation as they're wandering through the wilderness. You see, Korah and Dathan and Abiram, they said, why is Moses in charge of the Israelites? We have to work hard. We're from the tribe of Levi. Why do you listen to Moses? Who chose Moses over us. You see, Korah and 250 of the elders of Israel, you can read this story in the book of Numbers, chapter 16. They rise up against Moses and Aaron. And, and within that time, 15,000 people died because of the rebellion of Korah, because of the rebellion of 250 of the elders of Israel. In fact, one of the most unique events occurs during this time. In fact, Moses, as he's approaching uh, Korah and those rebels that are coming against him, uh, says that if these men die a natural death, then I am not your leader. Uh, but if they die in a unique way, in a way so that the earth opens up and swallows them, and this is what happens to Korah, Dathan, Abiram, 250 of the elders of Israel at that time, swallowed up. But we read a very unique event that happens in Numbers chapter 26, verses 9 through 11. Numbers chapter 26, verses 9 through 11. The sons of Eliab... Nemuel and Dathan and Abiram. These are the Dathan and Abiram who were called by the congregation who contended against Moses and against Aaron in the company of Korah when they contended against the Lord. And the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up along with Korah when that company died, when the fire devoured 250 men so that they became a warning. Verse 11. Why do we have 
many of the Psalms in the 40s. Why do we have Psalms 84, 85, 87? Because of this one verse. What does it say? Numbers 26, 11. The sons of Korah, however, did not die. What should have happened to the sons of Korah? They understand that they came from a treasonous line. Do you understand? They came from a line of rebels. I don't know if you've ever done a genealogy before. But have you ever found, um, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, the, those type of people in your genealogy in the past that, you know, had a, a shady, you know, uh, history? Uh, maybe someone who was famous because they were a criminal. You know, we, we like it when we have good genes, but do you understand that all of us have bad genes as well? The sons of Korah understood what it meant to have bad genes. They, they came from a person who has a whole chapter detailing his rebellion against Moses and how in a unique way he was killed, swallowed up by the earth. The sons of Korah, however, did not die. And so today, we get the privilege of reading Psalms 84. Today, we get the privilege of reading Psalms 85 through the line of Korah, the sons of Korah. In fact, in 1 Chronicles chapters 25 and 26, uh, we see how the, the responsibility of the Levitical tribe through the sons of Korah, their sole purpose in being in the temple itself, they were the doorkeepers. They were the ones, like Don and, and Janie in the back, who get the privilege of greeting every single one of you as you come through the door. Uh, like Mark with his smile behind his face. I, I love coming on Wednesday nights because that's when I get to see Mark. He, he, he makes sure that every single person is greeted with a smile. You can't see it on his face now. You can see it in his eyes. They had the privilege of making sure every single person that came into the sanctuary knew that they had the privilege of worshiping a God together, setting the tone for the worship, the important job of the doorkeepers. You understand as you read through this text, hopefully this flare comes out, written by the sons of Korah. Psalms 84, what does the title say? To the chief musician on an instrument of gaff. We learned about this instrument a couple of weeks ago, right? Uh, th this was an instrument that came from the Philistines. Who was the famous guy who came from the city of Gath? A guy by the name of Goliath, right? From Gath. Uh, David slew him with the, you know, uh, a stone right between his eyes, right? Uh, th this instrument that's taken from the enemy and used in praise of God. And the sons of Korah are praising God on an instrument of gaff. We sang a song tonight, by the way, that comes directly from this psalm. I always love when, when Kat, you know, uh, and, and she always does, it's, it, it's just the, the way the Holy Spirit works is to choose songs that literally minister to us before we read from the text. It starts out like this, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. I remember when COVID first hit, there was couches up here. We had to, we had to stay at home. And I was envious of the people that sat on the couches. I, I was envious of the people that were up here. Why? Why? Because I wanted to be here, right? I know many of you too. 
wanted to be here. And you're here tonight, and I'm, I'm so great, grateful for that. And those of you online, I'm so grateful that you're able to come. We have technology today that 10 years ago, if this virus would have hit, we wouldn't have had back then. We, we truly are blessed to be able to have the technology that we have in order to gather. But there's something about gathering together in the place where we worship God. And for the sons of Korah, understanding not only their past, but how God was using them now to be just a doorkeeper in the house of God and to welcome every single person that would walk through that door. The privilege of knowing that we get to worship the living God. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my king and my God. What, what are the sons of Korah saying? I envy the sparrows that get to live here all the time and have made their home here. I'm jealous for them. Because they get to spend all their time here. Verse 4, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you. And we have the privilege of saying, Salah, think on this, meditate upon these things. Not only did the sons of Korah write Psalms 84, but they also wrote another familiar psalm. No, maybe you know this one, Psalm 42. Uh, this beautiful psalm expresses a spirit of great gratitude and humility to an awesome and mighty God. See if you recognize this psalm. Psalm 42. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. When my soul thirsts for God, for the living God, when shall I come and appear before God? Who wrote that psalm? The sons of Korah. Or Psalms 44. For I will not trust in my bow, nor shall my sword save me. But you have saved us from our enemies and have put to shame those who hated you. Psalms 44, 6 and 7. Written by the sons of Korah. You see, they, they understood what it meant to come from a treasonous line. Their great, 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 great grandfather, Korah, the one who stood up against Moses and said, let us go back to Egypt. We don't want to wander in the wilderness anymore. The sons of Korah. Psalms 85, or Psalms 84, verse 5. Psalms 84, verse 5. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you whose heart is set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring, and rain also covers it with pools. I don't know if you've ever been on a long journey before. You probably have. Uh, but many people, they pass the time on a long journey by doing other things. Unfortunately, if you're the driver... Uh, of the car, you know, um, what do you have to do to pass the time? Uh, huh? Say that again? Stay you stay awake. How do you stay awake? Uh, many people sing, even if they have a bad, bad, you know, um, a voice, a uh, horrible singing voice. They, they still, you know, whether it's singing along with a radio, singing along with a CD or, or Bluetooth or whatever it is. Uh, I, I had the privilege of riding in a Datsun pickup truck when I was young, a and every single summer, and, and on Sundays too, we would pick up all the kids in the neighborhood. And the back of this pickup truck had a shell on it, and this was in the 70s before seatbelt laws were enforced. My, my dad had made two um, uh, benches in the back, covered them with carpeting, 
and we would stick as many kids in there. All different colors. Loved it, loved it. And my dad would sing these spiritual songs as we're going to church. Kind of went like this. <clears throat> boom, boom, ain't it great to be crazy. Boom, boom, ain't it great to be crazy. Silly and foolish all the day long. Boom, boom, ain't it great to be crazy. And he, he would do all these verses with this song. And, and the kids would really get, I remember it very, very well. On the way to vacation Bible school, by the way, okay? And what happened to the time when you're singing? What happens to the time when you're having a good time? It goes like that, right? It goes like that, right? You, you understand what happens to the time as you're having fun on a journey. This is exactly what the sons of Korah are referring to. What is it like to have a joyful person on a journey? What do they do through the long process of traveling? They make it go quickly. They, they turn the valley of Baco, which means weeping, into a spring or rain or joyfulness on this journey. And what happens to the time? It goes quickly, right? The time just seems to fly. You see, the children of Israel, they, they would sing songs too. As they were going up the mountain to the very temple of God. These are called the songs of ascent. And these psalms, these songs, they would recite and they would sing on their way up to in preparation for entering through the very doors of the temple, greeted by the descendants from the sons of Korah. Verse 7, it says this, they go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. And again, we have that second salah. And what does it mean? Pause, meditate, think on these things. Not only did the sons of Korah write Psalms 84 and 85, but they also wrote Psalms 45. My heart is overflowing with a good theme. I recite my composition concerning the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. You are fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword upon your thigh, O mighty one, with your glory and your majesty. And in your majesty, write prosperously because of the truth, humility, and righteousness. And your right hand shall teach you awesome things. Or Psalms 46. God is our refuge and our strength. Have you heard that one before? Written by who? The sons of Korah. Verse 9, Psalms 84. <clears throat> o God, behold our shield and look upon the face of your, and in our English language it says anointed. But in the Hebrew it actually says messiah. The word where we get the word Messiah from, or Christ in the Greek. Do you understand the privilege that we have every single time we come in fellowship with one another? We get to look upon the face of our Savior, our God, the Messiah. The one who came to earth for us. Who died for our Sins. We get the privilege of worshiping and looking upon the face of the one who saved us, the anointed, the Messiah. Verse 10, again, one of the songs that we sang tonight. 
<coughs> For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Do you understand how impactful this psalm is? To understand where the sons of Korah came from. To understand that you should have been wiped out along with your great, 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 great grandfather. Your seed should have stopped. And to know just the privilege of being a doorkeeper within the house of God. And then remembering Psalms 1. The, the privilege that we have of just dwelling within the house of God. I'd rather be here just one day than in the most opulent, the most beautiful a tent of the wicked persons. Uh, the most beautiful home of the quote-unquote rich and famous. I'd rather be with you, my friends, my family. Those that worship God with me. The longing for fellowship today is greater than ever. Do you understand that? Why? Why? Because a unique event has happened in our world. And people are longing. They're, they're yearning for fellowship. We all need it. You see, Korah, the one who rebelled against Moses, what did he want to do? He remembered what it was like back in Egypt. He remembered the meat that they could just stick their, their, their uh, uh, pole into the fire, into the, to the pot, and grab a piece of meat. They, they remember, or he remembered, the melons that they got to eat in Egypt. Unfortunately, what did he forget? The slavery. And he wanted to go back to the places of the rich. He wanted to go back to Egypt. And what does that cause to happen to every single person that wants to look back? It creates within you bondage. But when we turn to the Lord, we find out, as verse 11 says, there is freedom. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly and we should say amen and amen you understand the grace of our god it is overwhelming and abundant verse 12 it ends like this this psalm O lord of hosts blessed is the man who trusts in you. And again, in the Hebrew, this word trust is the word batak. It comes from a phrase actually in the Proverbs. In Proverbs chapter 28, verse 1, we see the word batak used, but, but in a different sense. It says in Proverbs 21 or 28, 1, the wicked flee when no one is pursuing. But the righteous are batak, bold as a lion. Have you ever seen a nature show? What happens to every single animal on the savanna? What, what happens to every single animal in the jungle that hears the lion roar? They book it. Except for those little cubs. What are those little cubs doing? Chewing on their dad's tail, chewing on his ears, right? Climbing on his back. What's the difference between those little cubs that hear the roar and all the animals that hear the roar? Same roar, same lion. What's the difference? 
All the other animals know they're going to become food. But what about those little cubs? The, the children of the lion, the children of that massive roaring lion. There's protectorship, there's security, and there's trust or batak. And it creates within those cubs a boldness. And they try to imitate their dad, by the way, right? You've seen it. Doesn't sound the same. But, but you understand the relationship between us and God. You see, we have the privilege of knowing the one who calms the storm. Uh, we have the privilege of knowing the one who within every single event holds the world in his hands. Who's in control of the world now? Not the governments. Not people. Not who. WHO, World Health Organization. Who's in control? God is. Who can we put our trust, our boldness in? The sons of Korah, they understood this. They understood where to put their boldness, their confidence in. Psalms 85, it continues on. Who wrote Psalms 85, by the way? To the chief musician, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Lord, you have been favorable to your land. You have brought back the captivity of Jacob. You have forgiven the iniquity of your people. You have covered all their sin. Salah. You understand how powerful those two verses are. The, the impact on every single person that puts their trust in Jesus Christ. What do we have the privilege of knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt. How many of your iniquities are forgiven? All. Amazing, isn't that? What covers every single one of our sins? The blood of Jesus Christ. Looking forward, those sons of Korah, as they write this psalm, knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt, those doorkeepers welcoming in the people that are coming to worship God, that God forgives all iniquity. Not only did the, psalms, or the sons of Korah write Psalms 84, 85, 42, 44, 45, 46, but they also wrote Psalm 47. You know this one too. Verses 1 through 4, it says, O clap your hands, all you people. Shout to the Lord God with the voice of triumph. For the Lord Most High is awesome. He is great king over all the earth. He will subdue the peoples under his feet and the nations under his feet. Uh, he will choose our inheritance for us, the excellence of Jacob, whom he loves. A very nationalistic psalm. Uh, portraying God as the one who has chosen Israel, the nation. The sons of Korah wrote that psalm. Verses 3 through 6 of Psalms 85, we read some of the most interesting questions. Maybe you've asked these questions yourself. Psalm 85, verse 3, it says, You have taken away all your wrath. You have turned from the fierceness of your anger. Restore us, O God of our salvation, and cause your anger toward us to cease. The psalm is written as a restoration and a revival psalm. In this psalm, we see two words that just stand out. This word restore 
and the word revive. Have you ever gotten a dirty, a grimy, whatever it is, whether it's from a garage sale, the dump, or someone's, you know, you know, just putting it out on the street. You pick it up and, and, and you know you can make something out of it, right? You just, you don't know how, but you want to make something out of it. And what do you do to that dirty, grimy, tarnished item? You polish it, right? You, you, you change either the bindings on it or, or you, you know, somehow sand it down. And what happens to the beauty that's underneath all that tarnish, all that grime, all that dirt, all that black? Something beautiful comes out. You restore it. You revive it. And that's exactly what God does to us. Except our tarnish, our dirt, our grime is worse than any grease. It is worse than any decay that we can see in our world today. Our, our tarnish is sin and iniquity and transgressions. Willful sins against the God of the universe who loved us even when we did not love him back. When we were his enemies, he loved us, the Bible says. And what did he do for us? He covered us with the most precious thing, his son's blood. And he made us as white as snow. He polished us up. And we became holy and righteous only through His Son's precious sacrifice on the cross for us. In Psalms 85, verses 5 through 6, will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again that your people may, and this is the Third, our word, restore, revive, and rejoice in you. You see, this is a plea for the spiritual awakening of God's people. A petition that God would restore their hearts with renewed devotion toward him have you ever needed to be polished by god have you ever needed to be restored by god have you ever needed to be revived by god all of us have needed a good infusion of rejoicing and, and when you see someone or hear someone in the fellowship of the saints that's rejoicing their head off to the Lord, what does that do to the congregation as a whole? It's contagious, right? And, and there's something about a rejoicing heart as the sons of Korah understood to the core of what it means to rejoice in the one who saved us, restored us, revives us. Verses 7 and 8 of Psalms 85, it continues on. Show us your mercy, Lord. Grant us your salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people and to his saints. But let them not turn back to folly. The true meaning of what it means to repent. You see, when we repent, what do we do with our lives? A full 180 turn is accomplished when we repent. We turn back on the things that have hindered us, our sins, iniquity, transgressions, and we turn toward our Savior and our God. What is behind us? The past. What is before us? God, our Savior. 
And, and this verse, it, it uses a particular word, on purpose. What does it say that's behind us in verse 8? The very last word of verse 8, by the way. We, we don't use that word too much nowadays. But it's the folly that's behind you, right? It's the foolishness of your past. It's the things that weighed you down, that hindered you, that hindered not only your worship, but your walk with the Lord. You see, true repentance always shows a heart of longing to follow after God. Practicing Christianity rather than practicing sin. Becoming better at following Christ rather than better at committing sin. Those things that we had perfected in our past that we have repented of are behind us now when we truly repent of our sin. Verses 9 through 13. Surely... His salvation is near to those who fear Him that glory may dwell in our land. What happens when the people of God repent, restored, revived, rejoice? What does God do? He looks on the land and He blesses it. This is the privilege. And do you see uh, the, the surety within the writer, the sons of Korah? Do you see the surety in their tone? The very first word of verse 9 says, Surely, this is a certain fact. It will happen. It is a guarantee. Verse 10 Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. How intimate is our Savior with us? How intimate is the God that we worship with His people? The privilege that we have to understand what these four terms mean and the intimacy of our relationship with Jesus Christ. Not only do we get to experience mercy and truth, righteousness and peace, we get the privilege of being at the very seat or the table of the wedding feast of the Lamb. The very first event that takes place in heaven, by the way. This massive party of the church of God, the followers of God, seated at the very table of where this massive feast will take place, the wedding ceremony of the Lamb. And can you imagine the patience of Jesus Christ for His bride and the joy that is to follow when the very last one who accepts Him comes into a loving relationship with Jesus Christ and the rapture occurs. And the privilege that we have of inviting people to that supper. Mercy and, peace, or mercy and truth, righteousness and peace. That intimacy, kissing together. Truth shall spring out of the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yes, the Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and shall make his footsteps our pathway who is leading the way who is preparing the way do i have to forge my own path no jesus christ already did it for us it's him that leads us as a good shepherd it's him that leads us to the still spring or to the living the living waters and the good pastures, the green pastures. It is Jesus who makes sure that we are fed and watered. The responsibilities of the good shepherd. He's the one that leads us in those 
paths of righteousness. Psalm 84, Psalm 85. Some of the most beautiful psalms in all the Bible. And and I hope as you meditate upon uh, these chapters this week that you'll take them to heart. But, But the question I have for you tonight is what in the past is defeating your boldness? What in the past is defeating your confidence? Is there something that's holding you back? And just like the sons of Korah, they they could have, you know, said, I'm not worthy to be a doorkeeper. I'm not worthy to enter into the tabernacle. Rather, our outlook should be, thank you, God, for allowing me. Uh, Thank you, God, for even allowing me to come into your presence. We are truly free from all the shackles of our sin, as the sons of Korah knew. We are truly covered with the righteous blood of Jesus Christ. We are made holy, and we truly have the privilege of saying, Lord Jesus, thank you for allowing me to fall at your feet, knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that you have accepted me. And if you don't know that confidence, speak with me tonight. Don't leave this building. Because you can truly know beyond a shadow of a doubt. See, Jesus Christ, he offered it to us. He offers it to the world. It is only through him that we can know true peace. It is only through Jesus Christ that we can understand beyond a shadow of a doubt that all of our sins are forgiven. It's the confidence that we can have only in Jesus Christ. And so, Father, tonight I ask that you would just speak to each and every single one of the people in this within hearing of my voice. Not, not only those that are here, but those that are listening online. That, that you would reveal yourself to us. And for anyone that does not know you, help them to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that there are people even in this building that want to share with them, that desire to show them the way. And we know that it's only through you. It's not through a person standing behind a podium or a person in a, you know, a suit or a person that, that has all the, the right words to say or a title. But it's just the people of God that, that know beyond a shadow of a doubt that because of what you did for us, we now can claim bold access to the very throne room of God who hears all of our requests, that calls us His children, His sons and His daughters. And to know that we sit under a king, the one who is God of the entire universe, our God of hosts, the Lord God Almighty, who holds the very world in the palm of His hand and is in control of every single event that takes place. And so, Lord, please help us to have that confidence tonight to know that we are Your children. Remind us today from Your Word. Remind us today that we truly are blessed to know you. And so, Father, I ask that you would bless each and every single person here, that you would use us for your glory, just like you used the sons of Korah, that you would use us as your servants to be the ones that rejoice, restore, revive. And that you would bring about a change 
in the hearts of your people that desire with all their hearts just to worship you. And so, Father, tonight as we go out, we ask that you would use us as your witnesses, that we would invite those that are um, on the highways and byways of life, that you would use us to invite those that we know are hurting during this time, whether it's online or here. We ask that you would just continue to revive your church, cause an awakening to happen with the hearts of your people, and help us to not look back, but to press closer and closer and closer in intimacy with you. We love you so much with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming uh, tonight. Psalms 86 and 87 for next week, please.